that's okay. <laughs> no worries. Words are words. Um, okay, so um, for next time, remember to complete the quiz on Sunday and um, to read the next four stories in Dubliners, which are also to be regarded as a set, right? So, you know, the, the, the stories that um, I'm giving you to read are all grouped around a particular theme or idea. And, uh, you know, today we're going to talk about how the collection is structured. But yeah, I just kind of want you to uh, kind of expect that that's the way these assignments are going to run. Um, so, what do y'all think of this? I like it. Okay. You like what? Did, were, what did you like about it? They were easier to read, or they're kind of fun to read. Okay. Um, I like the idea of paralysis. I find it intriguing. Okay. So maybe maybe we start there then, right? So what instances of paralysis did y'all identify in these stories? They went back and forth from like a more figurative idea of paralysis uh -huh. to a physical manifestation of it and then back to a figurative. And then in the end, I felt like it was both like okay. a mental and physical paralysis. Okay. Well, let's start with uh, examples of literal paralysis, right? Literal physical paralysis. Where do we see literal paralysis here? We assume that the elderly man, the first one, was paralyzed. Okay, yeah. And well, it had something to do with his death. Yeah, we're, we're, we're told yeah, that Father Flynn suffers from a kind of uh, palsy that progresses into paralysis, right? So yeah, Father Flynn and the sisters. Do we see any other literal representations of paralysis? A young boy in the same story who, like, it's only for a moment. He has to be, like, for, further pushed inside to go into the room. Uh -huh. In the other stories, we see in the very end um, with Evelyn, she's physically rooted to the spot, unable to move and get on the boat. Okay, yeah. Like she's physically paralyzed by yeah. the rail. But again, it's, it's, it seems to be a psychological, in those cases, it seems to be psychological, right? Rather than um, like a genuine medical condition, right? So yes, yeah, so we have Eveline refusing to be pushed onto the boat, right? You know, grabbing the railings, refusing to go. Right? We have the narrator and the sisters resisting being pushed into the room. Where, where else do we see figurative representations of paralysis? And the one about the the third one, I can't see the title. Araby. Yes. Okay. That one. Um. He's like mentally fixated on this one thing. He's like, his mind's paralyzed on like this one girl. He's unable to think or concentrate on anything. Okay. The fixation on Mangan's sister, that's the only name we ever get for her, right? Any others you can think of? When the two boys in the second story, they're unable to like just get up and leave when the strange man sits down to talk to them. Okay. All right, so yeah, we got a pretty good number here of kind of situations in which. Um, some character or characters are kind of like rooted and unable to move or able to do something, right? And unable to move forward in some way. So what do these incidents all seem to have in common to you? Maybe like this might be something that we put aside for a minute and come back to later. Um, but this is something I want us all thinking about, right? What else do we notice, apart from this kind of broad theme of paralysis, 
But all of these stories seem to have in common with each other. How else are they alike? They all talk about the church. Okay. Pervasiveness of the church and Catholicism, right? What else? What else do they have in common? I'll tell you what Joyce would call it, an epiphany. Yeah, yeah, yeah an epiphany. That's a good <laughs> yeah. Word for it. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, good, yeah, good observation. We're going to sit on that for a minute, and I'll explain what Joyce means specifically by an epiphany. Um, what else do you all notice these stories have in common? They all involve children in some way. Yeah. These all have a young narrator, right, you know, who is a child or an adolescent. Or um, if not a narrator, the perspective character, right, is a, is a young person, adolescent, right? Okay. Yeah, they're, they're all concerned with childhood or adolescence. And many of them are kind of like, like concerned with the kind of initiation into adulthood in some way. Right, the epiphanies that these characters experience often um, reveal something to them that strips away some level of their childhood innocence. Anything else you notice these stories seem to have in common with each other? In other ways, they seem to be alike. some sense of like wrong or sin or guilt here, right? lurking in these stories. Good. Now, we talked about how there is kind of like a, you know, a kind of realization at the end of the, the, each of these stories, but do any of these stories seem to end on a decisive note? Maybe a little bit, right? But by and large, they're kind of inconclusive, right? The structure is almost circular, right? The narrator off, the narrator perspective character often just kind of comes back to where they started. These are things you're gonna, like these are all things you're gonna notice uh, apart from the age of the narrators, the perspective characters throughout the whole collection, right? So what, what we're picking up here now are consistent themes that are going to kind of culminate in the dead, right? The last story in the collection. Um, but these are all ideas that the whole set is constructed around. Um, the other thing that I kind of wanted to point out, we've noticed, we noticed similar family structures in most of these stories, right? In a lot of these stories we have um, a child who is living not with their parents, but with an aunt or uncle, right? Or in Eveline, the prospective character is living with her father, but her mother has died, right? So we have a lot of incomplete or broken families here as well. To kind of uh, go with the whole church and Catholicism thing, we also have priests lurking in the background of a lot of a lot of these stories. Like they're not usually present physically. All right, 
we have in the sisters. We have Father Flynn, who has died. We have um, in an encounter the schoolmaster they're trying to avoid, right? You know, they're skipping school and hoping they don't run into him. But, but like, if they're supposed to be in school, so is he, right? Um, there's, you know, in Eveline, the, uh, the priest uh, whose name she doesn't know, who's her father's school friend, they have a picture of, right? And then in Araby, you know, the house that they live in was tenanted by a priest who died. And there are going to be there are some connections between those priest characters as well that we'll examine in a minute. But I think the first thing I want to do before we get any deeper into this stuff is talk about the overall structure of the collection and how these stories fit into it, and then discuss this epiphany thing that Hannah picked up on for us. So as far as the structure of the collection is concerned. The stories are arranged uh, into five sets. So the first four stories are all about childhood or adolescence. The second set, which you'll be reading for next time, is about young adulthood. The third set is about maturity, and this includes the story's counterparts, Clay, and a painful case. The fourth set is concerned with Dublin's social life. Includes Ivy Day in the committee room. I'll explain to you what Ivy Day is in a minute. A mother and Grace. And the fifth set is really kind of the culmination of all of the themes that run through the collection in the dead, which is both the longest story in the collection and the last one Joyce wrote. Actually, probably the last short story he ever wrote. Like Dubliners is his first major publication, but he also never wrote a collection of short stories, published a collection of short stories again. Uh, from here, he moved to the novel form. Um, and as we noted, each of these stories is arranged around a single epiphany. So does anybody know what the word epiphany means? A sudden or where it comes from? What's a sudden realization? Yeah, it's Greek for a revelation, right? Or a showing forth. And it was usually used originally in the context of Greek drama. And this was the moment in a play when a god appears and imposes order. So it's literally like a revelation of a divine presence. And then this mutates a little bit in Christian theology. Right? Does anyone know what uh, in the church calendar the holiday epiphany is or what it commemorates? Would that be a no? Okay, so it's the commemoration of the revelation of Christ's divinity 
to the three wise men. So it's, you know, sometimes the, something, it's called you know, the Feast of the Three Kings or also Epiphany, right? This is the date on which we always take down our Christmas tree. So one thing to remember about James Joyce is that he is very, very, very smart and very, 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 very highly educated. And one of the things that he likes to do is constantly prove how much fucking smarter than you he is. And so he's always like playing with ambiguous meanings of words and so conceding these kinds of um, ambiguous symbols um, in his work and kind of letting you know just how much arcane trivia about all kinds of different things he knows. So his definition of epiphany kind of plays on and departs from these older definitions. So Joyce's own definition of epiphany the moment in which a person or thing reveals its true character or essence. So one thing we want to remember as we're reading these is that these can apply to persons or things or both, right? So for example, the epiphany at the end of Araby is a kind of multi-level epiphany, right? So let's turn to that and look at the, the way the narrator in the story comes to his realization. Can I get somebody to start reading uh, on page 35 from I lingered before her stall, and then just finish out the story. I lingered before her stall, though I knew my stay was useless, to make my interest her wares, in her wares seem the more real, then I turned away slowly and walked down the middle of the bazaar. Uh, <clears throat> I allowed the two pennies to fall against the six pence in my pocket. I heard a voice call from one end of the gallery that the light was out. The upper part of the hall was now com completely dark. Gazing up into the darkness, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity, and my eyes burned with a with a anguish and anger. Thank you. So, what's the realization that this boy has come to? about himself at the end of the story. What has been his whole, what has been the consuming goal that has driven him to this bazaar? A girl told, told him she wanted to go to Araby and he went. Yeah. To get a gift for Mangan's sister, right? And <clears throat> What do we get throughout the story in like the narrator's descriptions of Mangan's sister? Do we notice any kind of patterns there? I feel like we get a lot of um, like silhouettes, like with her in the okay. in the um, street light. I feel like we see that a lot. Yeah, she's always just kind of like illuminated in the dark, right? Good. indicate about the narrator's level of knowledge or understanding about who or what Mangan's sister is. He 
Yeah. He's never, he's, he really only speaks to her the once, right? I think that he's just kind of like infatuated with like the idea of her. Yeah. I feel like sometimes people like, you can do that with like your friend's brother or something. Uh-huh. Maybe that's just me. And yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he also yeah, only identifies her as his friend's sister, right? He doesn't give her her own name even though he says at one point that he keeps repeating her name to himself, right? One assumes he's probably not sitting in that front window staring out at the, uh, you know, staring out at her, her front door saying, oh, Mangan's sister, Mangan's sister, over and over again, right? So he clearly knows what her name is, but he never gives it to us, right? It's kind of kept secret. And it's not important. Mm -hmm. In reality, it's not important. Because you only know so little of her. Uh huh. Yeah, you, we are left with kind of as hazy an impression of her as the narrator himself probably has, right? And many of his observations about her are, yeah, I said a little like a, a, a kid who, you know, kind of like is looking at a girl and kind of getting aroused for the first time, right? If we look, for example, on page 32, right? While she spoke, she turned a silver bracelet round and round her wrist. She could not go, she said, because there would be a retreat that week in her convent. Her brother and two other boys were fighting for their caps, and I was alone at the railings. She held one of the spikes, bowing her head towards me. The light from the lamp opposite our door caught the white curve of her neck, lit up her hair that rested there, and falling, lit up the hand upon the railing. It fell over one side of her dress and caught the white border of a petticoat, just visible as she stood at ease, right? So he's particularly excited here because he gets a brief glimpse of her underwear. And when we first see her described, like he's like noticing the movement of her body under her dress and you know her soft rope of hair swinging back and forth, right? So, he has these kind of look like, you know, physical kind of erotic impressions of her. But does he, does he seem to recognize these for what they are? No. How does he regard his love for Mangan's sister? Like, how does he frame it to himself? <laughs> okay, yeah, I think adoration and confused are both accurate, right? But does he really see it as confused? I think he says it at some point. Right, but he's also saying this kind of with saying that with hindsight, right? He's he had the realization by that point. Yeah, Hannah. Sorry. Um, I think that he sees it as a distraction, maybe not like a bad distraction, mm -hmm. but a distraction because. He, yeah. He can't focus on anything that he's doing. Yeah, it's definitely an obsession, right? Like a new way to live your life. Yeah. And some of the things he does strike us as maybe a little creepy, right? Like watching and waiting for her to come out of her house and then following her on the way to school. Making sure that your window blind is like that far. Yeah, away. yeah. So she can't see him observing her, right? So yeah, like you know, these are all things that a a, ki a shy kid with a crush might do, right? But he idealizes this crush in particular ways as well, right? So, um, you know, for example, on page thirty-one, can I get somebody to read the paragraph that starts with her image accompanying? Her image accompanied me even in places the most hostile of romance. On Saturday evenings when my aunt went mar marketing, I had to go to carry some of the parcels. We, we walked through the flaring streets, jostled by the drunken men and bargaining women, amid the curses of laborers, the shrill litanies of shop mm -hmm. boys who stood on guard by the barrels of pig's cheeks, the nasal chanting of street singers who sang, 
a come all you about O Donovan Rosa or a ballad about the troubles in our native land. These noises converge in a single sensation of life for me. I imagine that I wore my chalice safely through a throng of foes. Her name sprang on my lips at moments in strange prayers and praises, which I myself did not understand. My eyes were often full of tears, I could not tell why, and at times a flood from my heart seemed to pour itself out into my bosom. I thought a little of the future. I did not know whether I would ever speak to her or not, or if I um, spoke to her, how I could tell her of my confused adoration. But my body was like a harp, and her words and gestures were like fingers running upon the wires. Okay, thank you. So there's a chain of language here that I just kind of wanted to draw your attention to, right? Litanies, chanting, chalice, prayers. What do these words all have in common with each other? They're all religious. Yeah, they all refer to religious ritual, right? And I want to particularly come back to the chalice and the idea of holding your chalice aloft and bearing it through the throng of foes, but I think this also has bearing on the sisters. So remind me to come back to that. Right, this is one of the places where those stories link up. And where is he having these imaginings of this almost kind of like ritualized love? Yeah, in particular, right, they're shopping, yeah. right? So they're in, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're in the marketplace, right? They're, they're in the center of commerce. And like, I particularly like, you know, the, how you know he's hearing the shrill litanies of shop boys who stood on guard by the perils of pig's cheeks, right? And he's thinking of her and holding his chalice aloft for her while he's walking by the barrels of pig's cheeks. So, <clears throat> in this commercial space, he's having these kind of idealized ritual romantic thoughts, right? And in some way, his whole response to her is tied up in shopping and commerce, right? It's the only interaction they ever have is his promise to go to this bazaar and buy her something, right? And it's the bazaar that gives its name to the story, right? Araby. So what is the name of the bazaar meant to conjure up? What kind of image is it, is it supposed to suggest? A hodgepodge. Why would you say a hodgepodge? Just a bunch of different things and items from all over. Well, I, mean, I guess that's kind of what a bazaar is, right? I mean, a bazaar is, you know, literally a place where you buy shit. That you can't find at the regular mm -hmm. market. Sure. But even the, like, the word bazaar, right, has Middle East, is of Middle Eastern origin. So the fact that they call it a bazaar at all, right, is meant to suggest these distant eastern exotic places, right? So for Araby here, right, you know, read like, you know, Arabia. Didn't that one part he described her as brown? Or was that this small imagination? I wanted yeah, to he ask does, about yeah. that, but uh -huh. I was confused because yeah. Is yeah. she like Arabic or is she um, it's hard to say, right? I would suggest that in Dublin, 
around the year 1894, which is, we, we know, this is one of the stories that we can precisely date when it's supposed to take place, because this was a real bazaar that took place in May of 1894. Uh, but yeah, there probably weren't a lot of Arabs living in Dublin yeah, that's what I thought. in 1894. Um, so, um, the brown may be a reference to her hair, it may be a reference to the clothes that she's wearing, but yeah, he, 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 yeah, he definitely describes, yeah, he describes her as brown, right, which, you know, most, most Irish people, like, Irish skin, I mean, well, I'm Scottish and we have a similar kind of complexion, right, mostly kind of, uh, you know, pale and reddish, right, and that's, that would be the, the normal Northern European, <laughs> Appearance, uh, but uh, yeah, he, yeah, he does. Yeah, he does describe her as brown. Yeah, so I think there is maybe that kind of association there with. It just confused me because she was a brown silhouette, and then mm -hmm. he finally talked to her, and it talked about like the whiteness of her like neck and stuff. Yeah, she's a brown silhouette. Yeah, but he also talks about her white hands and her white neck, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where was it down here? <laughs> Middle East. Yes, Middle East. Okay. So, how many of you are familiar uh, from other classes with the term Orientalism? When we talk about Orientalism, well, yeah, we're, talk we're talking about an academic discourse that develops in the 18th and 19th centuries, and like people used to refer to Asia essentially, right, as the Orient, right? Okay. That's because Orient in Latin means East, Occident means West. So, yeah. Um, so it sometimes refers to China, Japan, Korea. Sometimes refers to the Middle East. Sometimes to South Asia, right? Uh, but yeah, so Orientalism was, in particular, the study of Asian language and culture. The problem with Western Orientalism was that it always tended to depict Asian cultures as somehow inferior to European cultures. Right, as a kind of exotic other. <clears throat> against which the West could measure itself, right? So there's a tendency, um, according, like the, the big theorist on this um, is a guy named Edward Said. He wrote a book in the 70s called Orientalism. Um, those of you who are in the theory class, if you haven't done Said yet, you probably will. Um, so, <clears throat> Said's theory is that the West tends to project characteristics it doesn't want to see in itself onto the East, right? So if the European is chaste, then the Asian is promiscuous. If the European is industrious, the Asian is idle and lazy, right? If the European is practical, then the Asian is uh, kind of like a dreamer, right? Now, one thing that's kind of interesting about what's happening in Ireland in the 19th and 20th, early 20th centuries is a lot of these tropes are being applied by the English to the Irish as well. So you might remember we talked about Matthew Arnold when we discussed uh, Oscar Wilde, also an Irishman. He was the Hellenism and Hebraism guy. Um, Arnold also wrote an essay called The Celtic Element in Literature.
which essentially made the same kind of argument about the Irishman in relation to the Englishman, right? Projecting these same kind of characteristics onto the Irish. The, 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 the Celts, that is the ancestors of the Irish, were a race of uh, kind of ineffectual dreamers um, who, you know, talked a good game and, you know, could, you know, make, make beautiful stories but didn't have the rational intelligence of the English. So I think that by calling the bazaar Araby, Yates, or not, not Yates, Joyce, I'm sorry, it's, it's the end of the day, the end of the week, I'm a little tired. <laughs> Joyce is doing a couple of things here, right? One, he's giving his questing hero a faraway exotic destination, right? I'm not just going off to a bazaar on the other side of town. I'm going to Araby. You're going on a crusade. Yeah, going, going on a crusade. Yeah, going on a crusade, right? Not just a quest, yeah. And he's going to bring something back for his lady fair. But it's also playing with this same idea that in the English popular imagination, the Irish are also a kind of exotic other. Now then, part of the epiphany here, right, is like, what does he realize when he gets to Araby and listens to the conversation of the people who are working there? If you look on page 35. Well, the point is pointless. Yeah, okay, yeah, the quest is pointless, right? Remembering with difficulty why I had come, I went over to one of the stalls and examined porcelain vases and flowered tea sets. At the door of the stall, a young lady was talking and laughing with two young gentlemen. I remarked their English accents and listened vaguely to their conversation. Oh, I never said such a thing. Oh, but you did. Oh, but I didn't. Didn't she say that? Yes, I heard her. Oh, there's a fib. Right, so... How is this disillusioning if he thinks he's coming to Araby? First off, what's the conversation they're having like? Like a he said, she said, you know, like, like, oh, like. Yeah, it's trivial, right? It's just ordinary people having a trivial conversation, right? And what else is depressingly ordinary about these people? They're English. Yeah. <laughs> he gets there and he's, he hears English accents, right? He was like, expecting some fancy, like, party, yeah. exotic thing for the way she described it. Uh-huh. Then there's just some English folks. Yeah, just a, a couple of English people selling junk, right? So, yeah, so there's a realization about himself, right, and the way he was idealizing his own lusts here, right, and his own kind of like awakening sexuality here, but also about the bazaar itself, right? That Araby, this thing that he had built up in his head, is just kind of a sham. And he's just stuck at the end of the story, in a dark warehouse in Dublin, not too far from where he started. Now, I want to go back to this thing about the chalice because of the connection to the sisters here as well, right? So what's the importance in Catholic ritual of the chalice? Yeah, it's you know it, it's used in the communion, right? It holds the communion wine, and as such, what does it hold? Uh, exactly. Yeah, if you are a believing Catholic, right, you believe that in transubst in the doctrine of transubstantiation, right, the priest literally turns the communion wine into the blood of Christ, right?
So how bad is it then if you drop the chalice and spill that shit? That's a no-no. <laughs> that's really, no-no. Yeah, that's really bad, right? That is, you know, <laughs> well, like mega, mega bad, mega terrible, right? But this is what Father Flynn has done, right? At some point in his career, he drops the chalice and spills the blood of Christ and is never the same afterward, right? Yeah, go ahead. I thought they said it was empty. It's still the vessel, right? You're not supposed to, yeah, you're not supposed to drop this. Still bad. Still bad, yeah. They say it with page 17, right? It was that chalice he broke. That was the beginning of it. Of course, they say it was all right, that it contained nothing, I mean. But still, they say it was the boy's fault. And poor, but poor James was so nervous, God be merciful to him. Drop it, he broke it. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, what else do we know about Father Flynn that might have led to him breaking a chalice? What else are we told about this guy? Does this have something to do with like, his most medical condition? Yeah, that palsy, right? You know, the fact that when the boy brings him snuff, right, he has to pour it into the pouch for him because otherwise he gets it all over the places. His hands won't stop shaking. Now that palsy and eventual paralysis is a symptom of advanced syphilis. which would have been pretty familiar in Dublin around the turn of the 20th century. Um, for a relatively small city, Dublin still managed to make itself into the syphilis capital of Europe. Um, it had a large and well-known red light district called Monto, um, bits of which, parts of which are still preserved uh, for historical reasons today. But yeah, um, because it was such a common uh, sailor stopping off point, huge syphilis problem around 1900. So we have a priest here who is slowly dying of syphilis and drops a chalice, right? And it's never spelled out exactly that this is what's up with Father Flynn, but there are suggestions throughout that there's something not quite right about the guy, right? We have, you know, the conversation of old Cotter, right? Who says he wouldn't want any children of his to have much to do with a man like that. And then we have this kind of this weird, um, dream that the boy has after he realizes Father Flynn is dead. If we look on page 11, can I get somebody to read starting with, it was late when I fell asleep. <clears throat> it was late when I, when I fell asleep. Though I was angry with old Cotter for alluding to me as a child, I puzzled my head to extract meaning from his unfinished sentences. In the dark of my room, I imagined that I was so, that I saw again the heavy gray face of the paralytic. I drew the blankets over my head and tried to think of Christmas, but the gray face still frowned, followed, followed me. It murmured and I understood that it desired to confess something. I felt my soul receding into my into some pleasant and vicious region, and there again I found it waiting for me. It began to confess to me in a murmuring voice, and I wondered why it smiled, 
continually and why the lips were so moist with spittle. But then I remembered that it had died of paralysis and I felt that I too was smiling feebly, as if to absolve the simoniac of his sin. Okay, so first brief pointer, does everybody know what a simoniac is, what Simon is? Okay, so simony is a specific sin uh, that involves the selling of the sacraments of the church. Right, so performing the sacraments for money. Um, I always laugh a little bit, like at the kind of childish response here. She's like, I pulled the cover over, covers over my head and tried to think of Christmas, right? But that's also going to kind of bring us uh, kind of circularly to the dead at the end of the collection, which takes place at a Christmas party. So that's, so we're kind of drawing those kinds of connections already here. But what else is like, what's going on in this dream? What's weird about this dream the boy has? Okay, yeah, that this monster, and the monster is Father Flynn, right? He seems kind of creepy, like he has, but he's getting like spit like on his mouth, he seems kind of like... Yeah, which is probably because of his condition, right? Oh, but yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I don't know, it just seems like creeperish, like... Yeah, that, that there's, there, there's something, like the way he's described, yeah, makes him seem unpleasant or unsavory or disreputable in some way, right? And... I think in that way he maybe connects also to the old man in an encounter, right? Who goes, sits down with these two boys, has this talk about sweethearts and little girls, right? Then did everybody understand what he goes off and does when he's done talking to the boys? Bree, you, you, you got it. I got it. You think you get okay? <laughs> You're probably right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then he comes back and he just talks about wanting to smack little boys, right? And you know how any little boy who was a sweetheart should be punished. Um, so, in addition to there being a lot of creepy old men in these stories, right? In a lot of ways, these creepy old men are also connected to a particular theme that is concerned with repressed sexuality. Right, so Father Flynn is a priest. Right, so he's supposed to be celibate. The fact that he's dying of syphilis seems to suggest that he did not keep this vow. And the old man in an encounter seems to be particularly ashamed of himself, right? And angry with himself for you know, having thoughts about girls or about women, right? Like so much so that he kind of directs it outward towards wanting to punish little boys who have sweethearts. And with Father Flynn, it also affects the sisters who are who give their name, you know, give give the story its title, right? What do we note about Father Flynn's sisters? What can we tell about the two of them? What if <clears throat> what have they spent their lives doing? Yeah, they've devoted their entire lives to taking care of him. Right? So are they like his actual sisters or are they like nuns? No, they're his, they're his actual okay. sisters, yeah. I was like, reading the whole day, I was like, are they his sisters or are they nuns? Or are so, they so what has probably happened here, right, you know, when they talk about poor James, right, you know, how he was educated in the Irish college in Rome and all that sort of thing, right? Educating your son as a priest was not cheap. And does it appear that either of these two sisters are married or ever have been? 
and why? And what's the probable reason for that? Well, one of them, she seems, I don't know if it's because of her age or not, she seems to have some definite hearing issues. Oh, yeah, there's the, the deafness. And then she uh -huh. also seems of very, very short stature. Her head didn't come above the banister rail. Okay. They wouldn't have a dog or that's the reason exactly yes the money that would have gone for dowries for them instead went to their brother's education so there's no money left for them to find husbands after james is sent off to the irish college right so they're stuck and they've adopted this kind of angel in the house role here, right? Very much like what Candida does for her husband in Shaw's play, right? Except in this case, it's not, you know, why, you know, the wife taking care of, you know, the important man. It's his sisters who have kind of devoted themselves to keeping him comfortable and keeping him happy and healthy. So this is a, you know, another kind of figurative paralysis here that we see in these stories. So <clears throat> I've drawn some connections here between uh, what we, the things we've read for today. Like, do y'all see anything else in these that you, you've struck you as particularly interesting or that you would like to talk about or you have questions about? Anything that seems particularly relevant or important? Okay, well what about things that, that maybe seem irrelevant or unimportant? All four of the stories Three of them have a young boy as a narrator, or main mm -hmm. character, and the final one has a girl just over 19. Yeah, and it's not it's not the same boy, right? But it's a very similar kind of boy. And yeah, the first three stories are all third person. The last one is is, is our first person. The last is third person. So yeah, what what do you think marks the difference there? Why do you think Eveline is different in that regard? Why do you think that might matter? She's older. She, okay, she's a little older. We're transitioning here from the stories about childhood into the stories about young adulthood, right? She's had more responsibility than the other three. She has to take care of mm -hmm. two children that aren't her. She has to take care of her father. Mm -hmm. She works. Yeah. So can we project what Eveline's future is likely to look like? If she doesn't go off, to, when she doesn't go off to Buenos Aires with Frank, yes. they'll be like the sisters. Yeah, probably very much like the Flynn sisters. Yeah. I Take, have a weird rate of question. Yeah. Why Buenos Aires? Like that just seems so random. Like, why Argentina? Like it's warm and sunny, and England is not. I could never. Well, you know, I, 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 I you know, I. There are a couple of theories about Buenos Aires like that, that scholars, uh, the Joyce scholars have, right? One is that Frank has no intention of marrying Eveline. Buenos Aires is a place that is significantly far away and would have been you know, legally loose enough that he could essentially take her there and force her into prostitution. And that that's what he's, um, his real goal is. And some, one piece of evidence for that is that the opera he takes her to is uh, Michael William Balfe's The Bohemian Girl, which it's not, um, it's a sentimental piece that's not especially well regarded today. I was playing the overture from it at the beginning of class. And that's all, this is also a piece of music, by the way, that creeps up again and again in this collection. Um, but The Bohemian Girl is about a kidnapping. So I think the, the, the folk song that he refers to, like about the girl who loved the sailor, is also about a girl who was taken advantage of by the sailor that she loves. 
So Frank's intentions are probably not exactly pure. However, the alternative, which at least is the devil she knows, right, is to spend the rest of her life at home caring for her father. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a great guy, right? Yeah, she kept like, trying to make up excuses for him. She was like, well, it wasn't like that bad this time and this time. And I yeah. was like, <laughs> oh, maybe he like, shouldn't ever be that. <laughs> yeah, there, there, was, there was that one time when we were kids that he did the funny voice. Yeah. Was like, <laughs> we weren't afraid of him then for a minute. Yeah, like, that's not good reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Home and he beat my brother. yeah. And now that the you know now that the, the boys are at like one of her brother one of her older one of her older brothers is dead, and the other is out of the house, right? She doesn't have anyone to shield her from her father's rages anymore. So she is going to be devoting herself to taking care of this guy, who is drunk and angry most of the time. So we have these you know women who are kind of waiting on these men who are disappointed in their lives in various ways. You know, whether they've screwed their own lives up or have been kind of like, um, you know, essentially disappointed by circumstances, right? They then take it out on people who are weaker than them who are supposed to take care of them, right? We're going to see a similar kind of situation um, when we get to the maturity section of the counterparts, um, these kinds of cycles of violence. So this is just kind of all stuff to keep in mind as we proceed, right? Um, anything else that y'all want to discuss or mention? One thing I know we didn't really talk about today, but I want you to try to keep track of, right, is watch for all of the situations in which money is changing hands, right? We're going to see a lot of coins passing back and forth from hand to hand. And this is something that's also going to be important when we get to the dead. All right, so let me give you the guide questions for next time. Remember to do the and we will return to James Joyce on Tuesday.